turning on the computer. Microphone is on. Chumbo Wumba t-shirt, check. Reebok pumps, check. Why is my computer going so slow? Aaron, why did we have to record this episode over dial-up? Wait, what's going on? Why is my computer so slow? What? What's going on? <laughs> Hello there. Wait, who are you? What's going on? No one of importance, but you can call me Freaky Friday. Wait, like the Lindsay Lohan, Jamie Lee Curtis movie? No, the Barbara Harris, Jodie Foster joint. Oh, well, sorry. Just, uh, we're actually talking about a different movie today, the 1995 film Hackers. I know. I've set a rat into your system, and now you little pop and lock script kitties are all mine! <laughs> but why do you care so much about our little show? I'm going to make an example of you. Now all your listeners will know not to mock the most elite hacksaws, unless you tell them Hackers is the best film of all time. Okay, I'm not sure they'll believe it, though. I mean... Uh... You will make them believe. Or I'll bring this entire thing down from the inside. <laughs> Welcome to Pop and Lock. I'm Landry Ayers. And I'm Natalie Dowzicki. Joining us today to discuss the cinematic pinnacle of the 1990s are two returning guests to the show, director and editor of Libertarianism.org, Aaron Ross Powell. Thank you. And senior fellow at the Cato Institute, Julian Sanchez. Hack the planet. (laughs) We also have a new guest on the show today that we're very excited to be joined by, director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Eva Galprin. Eva, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Aaron, I have just one question for you. Why in the world did you want us to watch this film, Hackers? Because it's amazing. It's it's an unbelievably great movie. Um, No, I thought it was. It's it's a fun time capsule of. I mean, I think it's it's maybe the quintessential '90s movie. Like everything about the '90s just boiled down, crystallized, like right there, Um, and. And it gives it gives a sense of kind of the way that at this early stage of computing, like the internet was just becoming a thing. This is just when I think we were we were switching over to using the internet from from the halcyon days of BBSs, um, and and the cultural the way that the culture was wrestling with this and the place of the people who were using computers and the people who were scared of the computers and. And it's a fun it's a fun way to explore like the way that things have changed in the cultural place of tech between now and then and the way that they're they're largely the same, but mostly just because it's really fun and the clothes are great. Uh, Eva, Julian, did you have a a fond memory of this film uh, upon rewatching it before this? Well, so I'll say uh, I, you know, I I know I saw it. um you know, back in the late nineties or early, early not, but, um, I, I, I didn't remember that. I mean, you know, I was in college, so I, I, a lot of things I saw in college, I don't remember that clearly at the time. Um, <laughs> but it definitely brought back kind of memories of my adolescence. So, I mean, when I was 12 and 13 year old years old, I, I, you know, uh, went by Lord cardboard and ran a, a dial up BBS, uh, in, in, in the two Oh one area code represent two Oh one. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I subscribed to 2600 and Mondo 2000 and all that stuff. And um, so uh, I was I was very much, uh, you know, conscious of that culture. So I sort of enjoyed all the little uh, Easter eggs that were sort of throwbacks to uh, elements of that time and place. Uh, and, you know, that environment of uh, kind of semi-comical panic about... Uh, you know, teenagers crashing, uh, you know, crashing the world economy somehow inadvertently. So Julian mentioned uh, a, a nice hacker name, and I was wondering if anyone else has hacker names of their own or what their hacker name would be. Aaron? I should clarify, uh, you know, my online handle was Lord Cardboard. I'm oh, not admitting sorry. to any, I'm not admitting to any violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, at, at any point in my life. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Eva, were you uh, uh, in the in that scene at all as a as a, a uh, an impressionable a young youth? Adult? As a young adult, as a, as a feral <laughs> child, um, I was a feral <laughs> child on the internet. And this movie came out at a time when I was spending a lot of time online um, because I did not enjoy uh, what we call uh, my peers. And at the same time, uh, it w the people who on, on whom this was based were people that I would later go on and meet, which I found very weird. So at the time, I remember watching Hackers and going, oh, like, you know, Penn and Teller, Hack the Gibson. Uh, you know, the big red book that won't fit on the shelf. These are all things that I knew. Um, but I was offended at how wrong it was because it didn't <laughs> occur to me that there was nothing more cinematically boring than watching a bunch of, you know, teenagers with acne, like slam Mountain Dew and wait for scripts to finish running. Um, and trying to explain what camaraderie was like on a bbs or in a forum was extremely boring compared to just like and now they're all hanging out in this nightclub playing video games um so yeah i remember thinking that it was a very bad movie with a very good soundtrack i agree i thought the music was really really good i really i was pleasantly surprised uh based on what i thought about the rest of the movie so far but i i found myself really really enjoying the music um, so I, I, you bring up an interesting, uh, point, uh, Eva, about the way it sort of depicts what hacking and how hackers are. Do you think the movie, does it, does it just get it wrong because it can't get the, like, it can't dramatize what the sort of culture of hackers uh really is and how it actually operates or do you think it is like a like a bad faith or not even bad faith but a, an an inaccurate representation of the desires of hacking culture i think to some extent it did a fairly good job of getting some of the essential bits of hacking culture across the the camaraderie the you know sharing of secret knowledge, um, that sort of thing. I think it really did a good job at. But in order to do that, it had to sacrifice a lot of the realism, which honestly would have been cinematically very, very boring. Um, watching people sit around in uh, in their basements, waiting for scripts to run and ordering pizza, is is just not very <laughs> exciting. Um, and trying to explain why this should be exciting to a to an audience that doesn't even use the internet every day. Uh, and that isn't used to the idea that your your friendships are all formed online and your friends groups are online and the secret information comes to you from the internet. Um, trying to explain that to an audience that didn't kind of live it every day, I completely understand why they made the choices that they did. Um, but I can tell you that 12 year old me, deeply offended. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll say, the yeah, I mean maybe the 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 sort of least plausible thing about it is the premise that um you know all these people who are you know fairly high level hackers happen to all go to the same high school, um, which uh you know my recollection is you know there were maybe one or two people uh, you know great I didn't go to this sprawling Manhattan I don't remember if it's supposed to be some kind of technical magnet school or something but um. You know, in general, I think it was you. You might eventually meet in real life uh, some of the uh, some of the folks you might you know at the the, the payphones at the uh, you know Citibank or whatever in New York where they have the twenty six hundred meeting. But um, but the idea that you would just sort of there would be like a, a kind of physical social scene of hackers in the space of a, a of one particular high school uh, was like a, you know not 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 the high school I went to certainly. Um, uh, you know, I think bits of it, you know, when they're doing the sort of social engineering stuff or the dumpster diving, um, the part where you see a scene early on where, where, um, uh, Johnny Lee Miller is, uh, uh, you know, calling someone up and sort of feigning to be, you sort of looked up the names in the company directory and saying, uh, yeah, I know I need a, you know, 
uh, and he's sort of dropping names from other people in the company to make it sound like, uh, you know, yeah, of course I'm an employee. I just, I need to read the number off the modem so I can dial in, um, is, you know, obviously done sort of comedically, but, um, that's not wildly wrong. I don't think, um, but yeah, when it comes to the actual hacking, it turns into Tron and, and, you know, like, like they're playing a kind of weird video game because as, as Ava says, um, you know, actually just watching someone, you know, run a script or, uh, uh, is, is, is not particularly thrilling cinema. Well, I would also like to jump in there that even if we didn't, it could have been way more boring if it represented hacker culture correctly or accurately. I still thought, uh, the movie was <laughs> relatively boring to begin with. <laughs> um, so this is the first time I watched this film, uh, I know, gasp, I'm, I should be ashamed. Um, but I just think, I just think with all of the unrealistic <laughs> elements, uh, the crazy CGI, all, all of that jazz was added in kind of an awful way. <laughs> um, I don't know what, else, I don't know how else to describe it. But um, for a first watch, I did think it was boring, which makes it seem to me that what Eva was suggesting that it could have been even more boring if it depicted hackers accurately seems rather frightening. And I'm glad that they didn't do that. So you're telling me that computers are not just <laughs> rooms full of lucite backlit columns with no. <laughs> like matrix text scrolling on them that you then have to walk through and send like equations through your mind in order to hack into that? I, that doesn't sound accurate to me. Is it even I, hacking if if there aren't like weird trippy visuals <laughs> before or after the actual hacking? As as we're mentioning hacking necessarily being somewhat boring, I think this is. I mean, we're not talking about Mr. Robot today, but that seems like maybe the first and only instance where they figured out how to make quite realistic hacking look cinematically really interesting. But you just have to do it in a very different way than the movie Hackers approaches it. It's also a very different audience. The people who are watching Mr. Robot, for the most part, have lived their lives online. You don't have to explain to them that there's an entire subculture. You don't have to explain to them, you know, sort of what the basics of social engineering are. Uh, you're talking to a much more savvy audience. And I should say, you know, hackers, so for all that it's sort of, again, trons out the, the uh, hacking scenes, it's full of some kind of delightful little Easter eggs for folks who are sort of familiar with that culture, the opening scene where the sort of the young uh, Johnny Lee Miller, uh, aka Zero Cool, is, uh, is sentenced for uh, releasing a worm which accidentally crashes uh, all these sort of big financial hardware is, is a kind of nod to the Morris worm, um, which was a kind of intended to be a kind of security vulnerability demo by a, a Cornell grad student named Robert Ta uh, Robert Tapan Morris, who was, uh, as it happened, the son of an NSA cryptographer. Um, but, you know, he had sort of made an error in how often it would, would replicate and so ended up causing uh, quite a lot of damage by crashing a lot of uh, computers on the sort of nascent late 1980s internet. One of the characters is kind of a double, a double reference. One of the characters, the one played by Matthew Lillard, uh, is his uh, name is Emmanuel Goldstein, which is, of course, you know, the obvious references to 1984, but it's also the pseudonym of the editor of 2600 Magazine. And his hacker name is Serial Killer, which I assume is uh, a reference to Robert Draper, Captain Crunch, who was a, um, a phone freak from the, I think, the 70s or 80s, uh, who was known for, uh, it was called Captain Crunch because... 2600, which is the name of a kind of storied hacker magazine, is the tone in Hertz uh, that would, for uh, a while in the, I guess, the 70s and early 80s, um, would let you essentially make free phone calls on payphones. It would drop trunk. It would, it would basically trick the payphone into, into, into giving you a free line. Um, and he discovered that you could use the whistle um, that was given out as a kind of free toy in boxes of Captain Crunch. And it happened to generate exactly this tone. Um, so you could use this kind of breakfast cereal toy to, to, to get free phone calls. Um, this is when it was in getting online by modem. If you were doing anything non-local was in fact, 
extraordinarily expensive. I remember, you know, as a as a young adolescent, some awkward conversations with my parents about the phone bill I'd I'd rung I'd uh, I'd racked up by dialing into various PBSs around the country. Um, so it's you know it is sort of peppered with these things that that it doesn't really make an, uh, that much effort to kind of hang a lampshade on. They're just sort of there, and if you were sort of steeped in the kind of hacker culture or whatever of that era. Um, you kind of pick that up and go, oh, they're they're referencing, you know, Captain Crunch. They're referencing uh, uh, Emmanuel Goldstein from 2600. Um, but uh, but if you, you know, it's obviously aimed at a mass audience. So if you don't pick up those things, it sort of slides along and you don't feel like lost. Interesting and obscure references that sort of collided with my life later on. Uh, for example, there are references to Operation Sun Devil. You know, I I was not of the generation of people who got picked up in, in Operation Sun Devil, but definitely a lot of the people that um, that I learned my skills from <laughs> had had you know sort of early uh, early brushes with the FBI that were not very pleasant. Got to do things like uh, spend Christmas in jail. They also went and interviewed all the uh, all the people at Loft Heavy Industries in in Cambridge. Um, so you have sort of versions of various uh, of various uh, well known Loft personalities there. Uh, for example, uh, the chain smoking kid Joey uh, is allegedly based on um, on Joe Grand, who went by Kingpin, who now runs a fairly large uh hardware uh company called um i think kingpin industries made the uh he made the badges at defcon for many 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 years uh, and if you listen to them they sound exactly the same it's actually kind of amazing <laughs> <laughs> this makes me wonder though but i mean the writing the genesis of this movie because on the one hand if you watch it it looks like it's a movie put together by people who only know about computers from what they happen to see in other movies about hackers. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's filled with all of these kinds of references. And so I just wonder how much the how much the kind of like nonsense of it was intentional versus how much of it was like so let me ask it this way. We've got did the did the auth did the writers go in and just read the names of a bunch of people and decide to drop them in? Or did they actually know what they were talking about, but decide to make this kind of off the wall, unrealistic bonkers set up for fun or for marketing purposes or for studio interference? Because it does, it does seem like it's almost this kind of schizophrenic thing going on here. My guess well, is that somebody in the studio said no one will understand this. Yeah, I do know, I mean, in pre-production, there was, like, for instance, like, Kevin Mitnick served as a, as sort of a, a consultant briefly with some of the filmmakers and the cast and crew that went on, but I, I don't know for sure how much of it was was really pre-planned from, from before that. I, I, I got the sense that, you know, at least the, the screenwriter had sort of done his research. Uh, it sounds like he had interviewed or, or you know, hung out with hackers enough to have a kind of sense of like, the real scene was, but I think they, they probably correctly decided that, um, you know, you needed to, to, if you wanted this to be kind of a mass audience film, um, you needed to sort of spice it up and have chases and have, you know, weird, weird and rollerblading is key. It's very hot. <laughs> um, it is funny how kind of, I mean, you know, Aaron said earlier, um, how kind of quintessentially nineties this feels there rollerblading everywhere the clothes are you know if you said dress you know dress people 90s uh you have the, the 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 kids all have like the nirvana posters and the uh you know the uh you know kind of bands of the era serial killer is wearing a velvet underground t-shirt oh that's right yeah he's got the um the the he's got the cover of transformer right the lou reed uh transformer but that's, cover that's shirt. explained by there's the the throwaway line in there about how his parents like missed Woodstock, I think, and kept trying to make up for it. <laughs> because what was said, then, so having grown up in in that environment in San Francisco, that was the bit that rang the most true for me. <laughs> and then at the very beginning, uh, zero zero chill, or I guess yeah, this is right before he decides to change his name to Crash Override. He, when he's sort of 
social engineering to get the the modem number he calls himself what mr eddie vetter i believe is what he yeah. says he is so it, it certainly is part of that um one thing that uh matthew lillard's character serial killer says when joey is kind of trying to sort of talk himself up uh along with several of the other hackers at the uh, at the club that they all uh, attend. Uh, he's sort of trying to prove himself, and they're all shutting him down. And he says, what you got to do is a righteous hack. To be um, elite. If you want to be elite. To be, to be elite, <laughs> yes. Um, Which you have to spell with a three and a seven. And, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was wondering, there was a part of me that thought, calling it a righteous hack, it... it came off to me as a sort of double entendre like is and and i wondered if that was intentional like w was it very clearly that he was using righteous as like a synonym for cool or was he was there some sort of was there some sort of double meaning that he's saying that the hack you have to do has to be you know for some sort of more highfalutin cause uh righteous in its in its desire and do you think that was intentional I think it was just used as a sort of synonym for epic. It needed to be. It needed to be big. It needed to be flashy. It doesn't necessarily need to go full Robin Hood, um, which I think <laughs> is sort of implied in uh, in the term righteous. Um, but I'm I'm not sure that that was on purpose. Uh, and I think that sort of gets at something that Aaron had brought up before we started recording that he noticed, uh, which was the the reading of the conscience of a hacker, uh, the manifesto that the cop is reading in the uh, police car as they're sort of investigating these hackers. Uh, what is, for those of us who aren't familiar with that, what is the significance of including that in a sort of almost throwaway fashion? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick that question over to Julie and Eva, who are probably more familiar with the backstory. I... I was aware of Frack magazine at the time, or I have been aware of I was aware of it before seeing this movie, but I was not a an avid reader. Um I did I did reread, I will say we'll put a link to the conscience of a hacker in the show notes because it is it's pretty great. Um it's worth reading. But but yeah, I mean maybe maybe one of you could speak to kind of the ethos of of the time or where that that manifesto was coming from. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. So this was a, a kind of at the time and the time here, meaning kind of the early 90s, sort of legendary document uh, penned by someone who I think his pseudonym was The Mentor, um, but became uh, very current. I mean, if you had any kind of connection to that culture, you had probably read this um, at least, you know, at least once or twice. Um, and in a way was uh, a kind of spiritual cousin to John Perry Barlow's uh, Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace in the sense that, so it's, you know, it's kind of cri de coeur from a young man kind of defending, uh, hacking as this, this uh, fundamentally as an act of, of, of curiosity and as something that's part of a way of finding a kind of better world than uh, is encountered in real life. Where I mean, a, a lot of the, 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 the the tone of it is is not just about you know what society is a criminal, but why uh, hacking and and sort of computer culture again in the like late eighties early nineties is something uh, that was appealing to a kind of young smart teenager. Um, you know the idea that this is a place where this online space is where where um, your sort of skill matters and not how attractive or cool you are where. Um, you know, computers provide this realm where you uh, can you know, learn to write a program. And if it doesn't work, it's because you made a mistake, not because it doesn't like you or because you, you know, didn't wear the right shirt. Um, and so in a sense, this sort of simpler and purer realm. Um, and, uh, you know, articulating this idea that um, the the desire to explore this space is something that should not be, uh, you know, frightening or get people demonized. Again, we have to remember in the context of the late eighties and early nineties, um, it was not, uh, it was not uncommon to have, uh, you know, government officials going on TV talking about hackers, you know, the way, uh, you know, they might talk about Satanists basically as this kind of uh, chilling uh, threat that could, you know, 
uh, bring down airplanes and shut down the power at any at any instant. Um, and I think you know we see that in the movie. Uh, you know, so there's a let's say the other really great hacker movie of the '90s, like objectively a better movie, uh, Sneakers, <laughs> um, with a whole with an incredible cast: Robert Redford and and Ben Kingsley and Sidney Poitier uh, and Dan Aykroyd. Um, but you know that one begins with a couple of young '60s radicals. Uh, hacking into financial institutions to make kind of you know stealing money, but but to make donations to various worthy causes, um, you know the NAACP or the you know environmental groups or whatever it was, um, and so you you know they then get busted. But it's clear that the you know in, in terms of kind of righteous hacks, this is something they're doing with some kind of social mission to it, and the initial sort of hacking we see in hackers after the the sort of morris worm scene is uh date or zero cool or crash override busting into a tv station to put so sort of cheesy uh cheesy old sci-fi movies on the late night television and then getting into this kind of comical fight with uh who we later discover is angelina jolie or acid burn um who is trying to kick her out not because she is trying to do something else but because this is her turf and he's now hacked into a machine that he hacked, she hacked first. Uh, and so they have this sort of test of skill over who's going to get to control uh, this system. And, you know, there's just obviously no deep sort of social purpose to it. It is something they're doing because they want to explore. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't, they're not going there to put on, uh, uh, you know, socially conscious public service messages. They are exploring and trying to find out what they can do. Um, which of course you know makes a lot more sense for for teenagers, I think. Uh, um, uh, you know, there isn't this sense that well, there's some higher purpose to what they're doing until the end, when of course, uh, you know, they they you know they they are hacking the planet and trying to save. Us. But you know, even there, I mean, it's interesting. I think the the the, the upshot of this movie, the kind of if, if there's a moral sort of to the movie, it is about the power of this sort of misfit community. Um, uh, it, you know, it's one of these movies where at the end they ultimately succeed, not because, or not just because, you know, the protagonists have the best hacker skills, or you know, uh, and and kind of beat the bad guy in in a Tron contest, but because these sort of, uh, I guess, pirate TV personalities who run a hacker show have sent out a call, and so hackers kind of all over the world. Uh, we cut to you know Japan and 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 Italy and other places where uh, people are kind of helping out by doing their own little bit of hacking from afar. And so I think the the kind of ultimate sort of idea here is yeah, there's the you know the short term cause by the end of stopping the bad guy who's going to capsize some ships so he can steal money from a company in a kind of elaborate plot with uh, with Dr. Melfi from The Sopranos, um, but um, but rather that. Hey, it turns out there's this global community that is, uh, you know, doesn't just stop at the people you physically know at the you know high school you all attend, um, and when the call goes out, uh, you know, they do all show up, they all kind of pitch in, uh, and uh, you know, not necessarily even because you know it's the right thing to do to protect their own uh, to to you know stop the this bad guy, but because um, they are a community and they protect their own. Can we talk about Mr. The Plague? So one of the big differences between watching this movie as a, uh, a sort of a teenager or a preteen and watching this movie as an adult is the um, sort of the first time around, you start by relating to all of the kids in high school and you're, you know, you're part of your little gang and you're running around on your, on your rollerblades. Um, and then we all grow up to become Mr. The Plague. We all grew up to be grew up to become, you know, what were sysadmins and then security people, and these are jobs now um, that people go to to make a living, and they don't build their entire, you know, personality around it anymore. Um, and I think that that really speaks to a a shift which got much more extreme uh, after this movie um, in the information security industry. Information security, well, to begin with, didn't used to be an industry, wasn't actually a thing. 
uh, your, your hackers were mostly teenagers. They were largely unemployed. They were doing things for fun. And those people grew up and started security uh, companies. They, you know, started loft heavy industries and at stake and F secure and Luda security. And um, they're, they're the adults in the room now. Uh, they're not necessarily, you know, capsizing ships in order to make money, but um, the idea of who is a hacker, I think has really changed since the nineties. And there was something so kind of wonderfully pure about the notion that you take all of these skills and you just use them to have fun instead of you take all of these skills and you use them to make money or to figure out how to you know destroy the hotel or taxi industry or or something like that and that's that's not a thing that we really talk about a lot anymore um because the whole notion of who a hacker is has changed so much. Puts me in mind of a line from another great Matthew Lillard movie, SLC Punk, uh, where his dad says to him, hey, they're having the argument about, you know, you're not punk anymore, dad. Um, and his dad says, I didn't, I didn't sell out, I bought in. <laughs> and that's to extent what you're describing. Well, I was gonna say, you know, it occurs to me, right. To the extent we have kind of, uh, you know, paranoia about hackers now, it is, it is, you know, definitely not, uh, oh, some teenager with kind of dark arts we don't quite understand uh, might do something crazy as a prank. It's the well-trained and well-paid members of a foreign intelligence service might do something as uh, as part of, uh, you know, a kind of coordinated attack uh, sponsored by a foreign state. That's the, you know, or some, you know, well, uh, you know, very sophisticated kind of criminal organization. Um, so it seems like the, the nature of the perception of the bad hacker um, has very much, I mean, because the world has changed, of course, in part. Um, but I, you know, I feel like we don't hear in the same way at all now about, well, you know, what might some teenager do? It's what might a Russian intelligence officer or a Chinese intelligence officer do? And that brings up something that struck me watching this, and it's not it's not unique to hackers, but to kind of this, call it roughly cyberpunk genre um, in general of, you know, the computer criminals versus the man sort of thing is who the who the bad guys are, because if we go if we go back to the the conscience of a hacker manifesto, the part that's read the two secret service agents sitting in their car and the ones reading it to the other, the part that's read in there is I mean, on the one hand, is like very subversive because he says, you know, we exist without skin color, without nationality, without religious bias, and you call us criminals. You build atomic bombs, you wage wars, you murder, cheat, and lie to us and try to make us believe it's for our own good, yet we're the criminals. And the you in that, given the list of things that's um, – that the atomic bombs and so on, the you is, is states, is governments. Um, the governments are the ones branding them as criminals, and yet – we have, like in this movie, for example, the bad guys are these corporate actors. Um, and yes, there's there's like government agents who are coming after them, but the government agents are kind of dupes. They're just pawns of the corporate actors. And and in all of the, you know, in the earliest cyberpunk and on through, like it's always it's always like the evil corporation. Um, but as you're saying, Julian, right now, like the the threat of the hackers right now, yeah, there's the, the people who, you know, break into Target to steal our credit card numbers and whatnot. But it's like it's like state, it's it's foreign intelligence, it's state actors. And so why is it that the ethos of the time, the ethos of these stories of hackers, whether it's this movie in 1995 or, you know, like Gibson's Sprawl trilogy or even say like going all the present, Mr. Robot, the bad guys are the corporations and it's not, it's not governments typically are the ones that are the real threat or the ones that need to be taken down. Um, and just one thing I might posit is it does seem like maybe there's, and this shows up in hackers very clearly, that like governments are too bumbling or too ignorant about this stuff to genuinely be bad guys in this space. Ah, the basis of my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, Wendell Pierce, who played Bunk on The Wire, is the kind of lead Secret Service agent, and 
you know, he's sort of portrayed throughout as someone who is not actually himself particularly technically skilled, you know, isn't kind of confronting them on their own terms, is, you know, part of the sort of spreading fear uh, about ominous hacker peril, but kind of more comic relief than the serious, the serious threat, right, is the ex-hacker, or the, I guess still a hacker kind of corporate guy, uh, the plague, uh, Fisher Stevens. So, yeah, and I think that's, that's probably right, Aaron. I think the, the you know, the, the perception that, you know, if you want the, the kind of, uh, a contest of equals, this is certainly at the time, um, you know, you are not going to find the most skilled technical people working for the government. Maybe, maybe you were at NSA, but not at a, not at an agency with kind of domestic law enforcement responsibilities. They were the ones kind of trying to figure out what all these blinking lights did. Well, there was also a point in the movie too, where the hackers were described as like, as they use the word specifically terrorists. I believe it's like in one of the news briefings uh, that uh, the secret service does. And I thought it was interesting because obviously this movie came out uh, pre nine 11 and our perception of terrorists has obviously changed since then. But I just thought it was interesting the way they were painting the hackers as 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 very dangerous and i'm sure that was playing into hacker let's say phobia of the time as um, we've all been hinting at but how has that hacker phobia changed to the point where now it's like aaron was hinting at that like it's other foreign governments that we would consider like the biggest threat is now cyber terrorism so or i'm just i'm government. a little com our own government right i'm a little Confused on how we made that giant leap. The APT One report. Uh, for those of us who you know wouldn't familiar know that, can you explain what that what that would be? Sure. So this was like 2011, 2012. Please don't quote me. Um, and uh, a security company, I'm fairly certain it's Mandiant, uh, came out with a report about how the uh, how Chinese government actors had been trying to break into the New York Times. Uh, and they were particularly interested in unmasking the sources of several stories about all kinds of sort of like backroom dealings and, uh, and corruption within the Chinese government. And uh, it mm -hmm. is my understanding that they were not looking to unmask the identities of these people in order to bring them milk and cookies. Um, so <laughs> this was, as far as I know, the first time that a government uh, or government aligned set of actors were identified as an advanced persistent threat, APT, were given a number, one, because they're the first, um, were you know identified, like here, here's where they work, here's the building they're coming out of, here, here they are, you can see them sort of working nine to five. Um, and that really changed people's perceptions, not only of who hackers were, but of what hackers wanted to do. People in journalism prior to then didn't consider people breaking into their accounts to be one of their, you know, the, the biggest and most looming thing in their threat model. Uh, and when I started doing things like writing uh, surveillance self-defense, one of the very first things that EFF did was uh, we concentrated a lot on how to defend journalists and how to help journalists and activists learn to defend themselves against these sort of state-sponsored threats. Uh, and that was because nobody had been thinking about that before. But I also had kind of a more fun question. Who is the most famous real life hacker? Probably Kevin Mitnick. Uh, that's the name that comes to my mind as, as someone who's not would not say that they are well versed in, in hacker knowledge. But that is one that I'm, I'm certainly much more aware of. His is certainly the last like kind of trial of a single hacker that I remember being like big news. Ross Ulbricht. Yeah, yeah, Ross. I mean, and that's the thing is I, you bring that name up. I don't think of Ross Ulbricht sort of conceptually as a hacker necessarily, which is, which is, I think, an interesting distinction. Uh, you could also say some th someone could consider uh, Aaron Schwartz a hacker necessarily and who is who is very well known for the what what went on when he uh sort of went into jstor's databases and everything but i th i think like you said eva the concept of what a hacker is and wants has kind of shifted who we consider to be both a, a threat and who kind of earns that label somewhere up there might be kevin polson 
not necessarily because he was so famous for his hacking, but because he then went on to be a, a you know, somewhat prominent journalist uh, for Wired and then the, the, I think, Daily Beast. Um, so, well, do you want to argue uh, that Julian Assange was the world's most famous hacker? Oh yeah, uh, I, it was that guy. But again, I guess it's, it's one of those. What he's famous for is not really the hacking exactly. Right? It's the yeah, they're trying to nail him on the hacking. That's true. Well, okay, true. Although somewhat spuriously in the in the. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the actual charges is that right, he sort of agreed to help crack a password that it sounds like he didn't succeed at. Um, so, uh, uh is that so hacking? a famous failed hacker, maybe. <laughs> wow. He's, he's not so, he's care, just, you be careful. He's going to, he's going to cut into this, uh, this stream when we're podcasting. And I bet he's got a lot of opinions about 1995's hackers too. I think it's very clear that Julian Assange was influenced by hackers, by this, by this whole idea that, you know, that the people at the bottom, that the cyberpunks. We're, uh, we're going to influence global events, and we're going to go head to head with, uh, with the instruments of state. And uh, I'm not about to say that went out well, <laughs> but it was, it was definitely an influence in there. Does that, though, that makes me think, and this, this might tie back, Eva, to your, your point about kind of becoming the adults in the room. Is So a lot of people who were in that scene went on to become cybersecurity people themselves. But it does seem like the, the kind of ethic of it, of exploring ways to, you know, as the Hacker Manifesto lays out, to kind of establish these other worlds free from the control of governments and, you know, free from kind of the social rules that made a lot of these people uncomfortable in high school and so on. Um, has has shifted that it's it's less now about breaking into stuff, trying to figure out if you can you know make free payphone calls and so on, or you know dumpster dive for passwords, and more that it's now shifted to building things that enable more people to themselves escape from these systems of control. So I'm thinking about you know like like the crypto community. Right has has that kind of ethic, but it's less about breaking into stuff. It's more about building new things, or or people who are building um, encrypted messaging services, or other other systems that would enable all of the rest of us to live these kinds of protected lives from surveillance and control. Is that is that accurate at all? Like, is it the same? It's the seems like the same ethic has moved into kind of building versus breaking in. I think people are still breaking in. If you like go Google Zoom vulnerabilities for this week. Sure, sure. Um, I think the primary difference is that it used to be that that encrypted messaging, email, the you know, online chat, uh, the digital currency, that these were all things used by uh by people on the margins, by you know, by geeks and nerds and by people who expected to be thrown into lockers by jocks. And that's not the case anymore. We are the grown-ups. We are the adults in the room, uh, and we have a level of responsibility that we absolutely did not have in the early '90s uh, to to use that power well. And some people have, and some people did not. Yeah, I would. Um, I completely agree with that. What Eva was just saying. Um, so we're about wrapping up here. Does anyone else have any, have any other thoughts on hackers before we move into our little locked in segment about what we talk about other media we've been consuming? Were there anything about, was there anything about hackers we didn't get to hit on that we still want to? I, so, I, you know, the last thing I'd say is just to, yeah. to leapfrog off that is um, it is interesting to me that, that in a sense, right, Plague, this, the Fisher Stevens character seems more... I mean, he seems basically, you know, on the spectrum somewhere. Clearly, he's got a kind of Nietzschean speech about how he doesn't have friends, only kind of temporary allies. And do we want to be allies? Um, but the, you know, the, the kind of the main protagonist couple here uh, are uh, extraordinarily, you know, Johnny Miller and, and Angelina Jolie, extraordinarily attractive kind of white people who it seems like probably, you know, in, in any real social environment would not, not be, you know, who are very cool and going to clubs and rollerblading around and are, you know, you kind of go, well, how alienated are these people plausibly really? Um, 
you know, and you have some other you have an interestingly kind of diverse cast. You have um, uh, the phone freak who's a, a Latino actor who's kind of coded. I don't think it's explicit, but he's sort of coded queer in 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 the way he sort of presents uh, in the film. Um, but otherwise, you kind of get the sense of, well, how marginal, you know, are, are these guys actually that, you know, marginal seeming? Um, they, they don't seem like that. Wow, they seem quite popular and they're going to clubs and they're having kind of a grand old time in uh, in, in physical space. And so um, to some extent, one of the things that I think, you know, is missing from hackers is the sense of, you know, that th- these are people for whom an online kind of world in which they can feel more comfortable is something that would be, uh, be necessary and appealing. Um, you know, again, you gotta, gotta, gotta sell the movie tickets. It doesn't match my experience as a 14 year old hanging out at friends' houses on BBSs at all. None of us were that cool. I'm still not that cool. Me neither. (laughs) (laughs) We're all that cool guys. Look at us now on a podcast talking about 1995's hackers. We've made it. All right. (laughs) Uh, So now we've come to the part of the show where we get to explore what other media we're all consuming lately that's not hackers. Uh, This is Locked In. So Aaron, Eva, Julian, what are you locked into now? Well, um, I have just... uh, I'm watching two almost entirely identical shows right now uh, about cyberpunk dystopias uh, because I don't get enough of that in my regular life. And so... (laughs) I'm watching season three of Westworld, uh, and I really hope that whoever is writing Westworld these days is just taking enormous bags of money and leaving them on William Gibson's doorstep. (laughs) Just here, we know we owe you money, take this money. Yeah. Uh, And then I started watching Devs on uh, on Hulu, which uh, has a whole lot of very similar themes and starts with, you know, the people working for some potentially weird and evil company that has, you know, that has managed to model all of humanity uh, while, you know, living in a Victorian in San Francisco and taking what is pointedly not a Google bus to somewhere uh, in the, in the South Bay. And it feels both very familiar. And also is, is this what our lives look like to people outside? (laughs) so TV, my partner and I have been watching uh, The Magicians, a sci-fi series based on Lev Grossman's novels, which is now in its final season, as well as season three of Westworld. Uh, I uh, just started Doom Eternal, um, the game, and am intending to finish Control, um, another kind of shooter game. Uh, it, it's sort of inspired by uh, The X-Files and uh, a little-known uh sci-fi miniseries called the lost room from the early knots uh and oh, also i love the lost room well so good the, the game control is obviously uh lifting a lot of its ideas from there and uh, uh a game i started a while back uh called return of the obra den which is a great kind of detective mystery game uh off steam um that is that i think is on the switch now too but is quite good uh and then reading uh aside from the kind of boring stuff i read as a uh, you know surveillance person um uh, i just i got i just got through the first book of richard cadry's uh sandman slim series which is a kind of noir urban fantasy uh i am um, uh reading the history of opera um by carolyn parker and roger something and um i just started nk jemison's uh uh the city we became uh and so uh enjoying the sandman slim there you know kind of light fun frivolous stuff but um you know we need we need a little something light uh these days i am sheltering in place with three young children in a small house um and so my my media consumption has been rather less than i would like it to be but i guess i am binging two different things so first my 10 year old daughter recently discovered doctor who so I'm rewatching all of the like the new Doctor Who with her. We're into we just wrapped up the first season of David Tennant, and that has been quite fun. Not just because the show is quite fun, and I, I always forget how just kind of relentlessly charming it is, but but also just watching my daughter really get into Doctor Who and become 
entirely obsessed to the point where don't tell her, but she, so she has a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Um, I just ordered her the Doctor Who role-playing game, which should be here whenever Amazon feels like it. So um, she can, she can kick into that with her friends. So that's been a lot of fun. And then on my own, um, the, almost all of the 55 volumes of Ed McBain's 87th Precinct novels are free on Amazon's Kindle lending library. So I have been making up for lost time on those. Um, and those are just probably the best police no series of police novels ever written and wonderful as kind of time capsules. The first one was published in 1956 and they go th all the way through to, I think his death in 2005 or 2006. And so just the, the changing nature of American society and attitudes towards police. Um, and they also feature the, I think the, best dialogue this side of Elmore Leonard? Uh, so far in quarantine, I have been uh, locked into, I just started Killing Eve. Oh, so good. Um, which is, I, I really enjoyed it. I've only seen about three episodes so far, uh, but uh, I'm hoping to delve into that a little bit more. Um, I've been rewatching Arrested Development, um, just to sort of a, a comfort watch. Um, I also, uh, speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, Aaron, have started a, a new, a second Dungeons and Dragons campaign with some friends and my brother, uh, specifically set in Wildmount, which is the new setting that uh, Wizards of the Coast just released in partnership with Matthew Mercer and Critical Role. So I got my Explorer's Guide to Wildmount uh, campaign guide and have been sort of perusing through that and trying to you know learn about this whole setting and uh, sort of craft my own uh, story for my players to to go about in during that. Uh, I also game wise have been uh, I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing New oh Horizons my on my Switch. Stop. I've been farming pears <laughs> and cherries and I am operating on an entirely bug sale based economy. On my island, I've been selling a lot of bugs um, to the to uh, the little store in town. I say you reminded me that my my Call of Cthulhu group has not met since uh, the uh, you know quarantine began, but we were on the verge of starting uh, uh, Masks of Nyarlathotep, which is a kind of sprawling Call of Cthulhu campaign. And now that everyone's actually kind of stuck at home, well, you know, we, it was almost kind of difficult to schedule a bunch of adult professionals to meet up. But uh, you know, as long as we can do it over. Uh, you know, roll 20 or zoom, uh, maybe, maybe now is the time to finally get into that when everyone is sort of, uh, uh, you know, stuck without, without a lot of other physical presence obligations. Uh, I also have also been, uh, wanting to get back into Return of the Oprah Din, which you mentioned, Julian, I have it on steam and I played several hours of it, uh, and then got busy and had to put it down, but I need to return to it. Uh, and I also have been reading, uh, I just started Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, which is about a series of murders in, I believe, Oklahoma, um, and the birth of uh, sort of the FBI, I believe, um, which is a, a fascinating uh, story, uh, true crime, but not necessarily as gruesome as some other true crime stories tend to be. Uh, so that's what I've been enjoying. For me, um, I'm also a huge Westworld fan, so I've been keeping up with the recent season. I also watched all of Tiger King in one day. I was pretty proud of myself for that. Um, and then on the reading front, I finished Where the Crow Dads Sing, and I started a new book called Ghost Wars by Steve Cole. It's a nonfiction book um, about uh, the war in Afghanistan. It's very interesting. Um I don't really do much gaming, but I think by the end of this, Landry may or may not convince me to start playing Animal Crossing, especially if I had to be stuck at home for much longer. Um, Come to my island, Natalie. Come <laughs> yeah. visit me in my tropical paradise. One of these times I'll just give in. <laughs> um, I have, when it's I have raining. every type of fruit. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of what I've been to. I don't really, I'm not really into too many tv shows right now except for my normal ones like westworld like i already said so that's what i've been locked into oh oh and puzzles <laughs> that doesn't count as media but i've been really into puzzles <laughs> there now all will know not to mock the most elite hackers 
Now to just spoof a different IP as I make my way out of the system. What? What's going on? <laughs> Not so fast, Freaky Friday. Or should I say... Aaron Powell? Hey, Landry? Enough! You thought you could get us to watch one of your favorite movies, and you succeeded. But you've got another thing coming if you think you're getting away with this one. Computer, execute command, elite override. Ah, much better. Thanks for listening. If you liked our show today, or have your own feelings about this cinematic classic, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Pop and Lock Pod. That's pop, the letter N, lock, with an E, pod. Make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. We look forward to unraveling your favorite show or movie next time. Pop and Lock is produced by me, Landry Ayers, as a project of libertarianism.org. To learn more, visit us on the net at www.libertarianism.org.